As stated previously, there is no doubt that the Soviets had fired at least 21 ICBM test vehicles by 1 January 1960. And from the Sputniks and Luniks, we know they have solved the problems of propulsion and guidance necessary for an effective ICBM weapon system. How well they have solved the re-entry problem is not known, but they have made notable advances in geodesy, cartography, and gravimetry, important requirements in firing missiles. We estimate they can now pinpoint the geographic position of targets in the United States to within one quarter of a mile or less. Concerning probable Soviet ICBM weapon characteristics, available intelligence does not permit a precise estimate. However, Knowledge of the Soviet development program, coupled with U.S. research and development in the ballistic missile field, leads to the conclusion that the first generation Soviet ICBMs probably have these characteristics. Partial or parallel configuration based primarily on telemetry analysis. A speed of Mach 25, necessary for a 5,500 mile ballistic trajectory and in fact observed by radiant intercepts. Guidance of the initial operational ICBMs is likely to be by radar track radio command inertial with all inertial guidance possible in the near future, and an initial operational capability CEP of three nautical miles, improving to two nautical miles by 1963. Payload available for the warhead would probably yield about eight megatons. Improvements of Soviet ICBMs should incorporate appreciable differences in reliability, payload, and accuracy, and almost certainly incorporate a heavy decoy capability. Order of accuracy attributed to the first Soviet ICBMs makes its military effectiveness contingent upon development of a nuclear warhead of high yield and relatively low weight. Early achievement of a warhead weight yield relationship compatible with the expected missile accuracy is now indicated. Regarding nuclear material, we know that the Soviets have an extensive research and production program. At the present estimated rate of expansion, we believe that by mid-1961, the Soviets are likely to have enough nuclear warheads to meet the requirements of their available weapon systems. It is probable that first-generation Soviet ICBMs will be launched from comparatively simple fixed bases. We believe, however, that the ICBM will have some mobility and will be rail-supported. Fixed installations may include, as a minimum, relatively simple launch pads, checkout and control facilities, and possibly guidance equipment. The Soviets are considered to have the capability to harden their operational ICBM bases. It is estimated, however, that initially all Soviet ICBM bases will be soft. In the period 1962 and after, it is possible that some of the bases will be hardened to withstand overpressures as great as 100 PSI. We estimate all Soviet ICBM bases will be inside the USSR. Bases will probably be on or near rail lines. It is likely that they will be located near air bases and major industrial or military installations. Other factors probably influencing the location of missile bases include security, proximity to industrial support, climate, physiography, and booster impact requirements. Distance to target is a primary consideration, but not a limiting factor, due to the probable range of the Soviet ICBM. In general, it appears that the URLs the area along the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and the region served by the kotlas vorkuta rail line in northwestern USSR are especially well suited for ICBM deployment. However, ICBM launch sites certainly can be located elsewhere in the Soviet Union. The emerging nature of the ICBM threat to the United States is best defined by an overall estimate of Soviet capabilities during the next 10 years. During this period, it is expected that the Soviet aerospace threat will consist of a mixed force of ICBMs and long-range bombers, some armed with air-to-surface missiles. In any such attack, we believe the highest priority would be against SAC bases and any ICBM launching facilities we might have in operation in order to blunt our retaliatory strike capability. This would be followed, if possible, by attacks against our major industrial and political centers. The operational inventory of ICBMs is estimated to be 50 in mid-1960 and 250 in mid-1961. Of these, it is expected that about 22 could reach U.S. target areas in an initial strike in 1960 and about 125 in 1961. 
The CEPs are estimated to be three nautical miles, and the warhead yield could be as high as eight to 10 megatons. Of the total strategic bomber tanker force of 1,250 aircraft, it is expected that excluding those kills from enemy action, some 500 to 600 bombers should be able to reach U.S. territory. This force would consist mostly of jet medium bombers flying refueled one-way missions. The weapons carried could be nuclear bombs yielding 8 to 12 megatons in 1960 and 10 to 20 megatons in 1961, provided testing is resumed. Bombers could carry air-to-surface missiles having 55 nautical mile range in 1960 and from 55 to 350 nautical miles in 1961. By the 1962-1963 period, the total operational ICBM inventory could be as high as 500 in 1962 and 800 in 1963. Of these, 288 could reach target areas in 1962 and 490 in 1963. The CEPs are expected to improve to at least two nautical miles by 1963. The warhead yields could be 10 megatons or higher by 1963, provided testing is resumed. By the 19th period, the total strategic bomber force is expected to be stabilized at about 1,000 aircraft and have a larger percentage of jet-heavy bombers and tankers and a few supersonic dash bombers. Of this estimated inventory, we expect 400 to 500 aircraft to be able to reach United States territory. Not counting losses due to enemy action, this force should be able to recover about a third of its strike bombers for subsequent missions. The weapons carried would be bombs yielding up to 20 megatons if the Soviets resumed testing and air-to-surface missiles with ranges of at least 350 nautical miles. The heavy bombers should be able to carry two such missiles. It is also expected that by 1963 the Soviets could have operational about six nuclear-powered guided missile submarines capable of launching about 70 ballistic missiles with ranges of 500 to 1,000 nautical miles with CEPs of two to four nautical miles. It is much more difficult to define the nature and composition of the Soviet aerospace threat for the 1964 to 1970 period. However, certain developments are expected. The number of strategic bombers is expected to remain at about 1,000. We expect the Bayer turboprop bomber to be gradually replaced by a nuclear bomber beginning in the 1964 period, and a supersonic bomber is expected to replace a large part of the Badger force in the latter half of this period. The air-to-surface missile is expected to improve in accuracy and range, and although there is no evidence of the development of an ASM with ranges in excess of 500 nautical miles, such weapons are estimated to be within Soviet technical capabilities. Flexibility provided by the nuclear bomber and the increased speeds and altitudes of the supersonic bomber, as well as higher yield weapons, should give the Soviets a greatly improved manned air weapons capability. Although there must be some fairly wide parameters in any estimate of Soviet operational ICBM inventories beyond 1963, they have the industrial capability to build an inventory of at least 2,000 ICBMs by the late 1960s. The United States Air Force has consistently maintained that the Soviets are trying to achieve decisive military superiority. The major weapon systems which would affect this capability appear to be nuclear-propelled and supersonic bombers and reliable and accurate ICBMs. Thus, the Air Force believes the Soviets will continually maintain a large mixed force of ICBMs and bombers for the foreseeable future and further improve speeds CEPs and reliabilities. Gentlemen, this concludes the air intelligence presentation of the development of the Soviet ballistic missile threat to the United States. May I remind you again that the classification of this briefing is secret. On the 20th and the 31st of January, 1960, the Soviets successfully launched two additional ICBM test vehicles to extended range into the Pacific a total of 23 successful firings to date. The Soviets claim these firings were part of their space development program using more powerful multi-stage ballistic rockets. This may be true. However, the evidence of an instrumented nose cone re-entry and previously estimated capability of the Soviets with their known hardware 
leads us to the view that these firings should be looked upon as ICBM shots for determination of accuracy and re-entry characteristics at extended ranges. In any case, the demonstrated and announced accuracy of these firings indicates the existence now of a formidable ICBM weapon system. <laughs>